Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Caltech Astronomy Stargazing Lecture for this evening for our December, our end of 2021 Stargazing Lecture on the topic of fast radio bursts, uh, a really new and interesting astrophysical phenomenon that's revealing all sorts of stuff about uh, about the ends of the lives of stars, as well as cosmological structure in the universe. So thank you for joining us on your Friday evening. I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm a computational astrophysicist uh, here at Caltech, and I will be your MC for this evening's event. So welcome. Um, uh, so just a couple of announcements, and the, the layout of tonight's event will be I'll, I'll finish giving a couple of, of announcements and then we'll launch directly into a talk by our, our guest, Dr. Liam Connor, who will give a roughly 30 minute presentation on these fast radio bursts. We will immediately follow that up with a Q&A session uh, that's con that, that consists of both Liam, myself, and then two other guests who are members of the department and in Caltech astronomy and are PhD astronomers or one who's a proto PhD astronomer. She, she will be getting her PhD very shortly. Um, and, and we all have different specialties in the field of astrophysics. So we'll be able to address, hopefully address all of your questions that you might have, not just on the content of Liam's presentation on fast radio bursts, but also on various questions in the field of astronomy and space science and astrophysics. So if you have a question that's you've been contemplating for a few months about something or 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 something that comes up over the contents of uh, over the the um, duration of the presentation, feel free to ask it in the in the comments section of either YouTube live or Facebook live, the two different venues in which we're giving this this uh, live stream and we'll try and address it during the Q&A and the Q&A will last a little over an hour until we get to nine o'clock p.m. Pacific time. So um, yeah, so that's the layout for tonight. And then in general, we have these events about once a month on Friday nights. I haven't yet assembled the schedule for, for the next year, but we should start up probably in the middle of January, 2022, and have these, uh, have these events continue on either from members of the primarily from members of the astronomy department at Caltech, but sometimes uh, members of JPL, uh, the NASA, NASA Center here in Pasadena. And there is a sister series of events called Astronomy on Tap that we also organize that happens on one Monday night a month. Uh, those are traditionally held in a bar over drinks, but we're still doing them over YouTube Live. And and those consist of two 15-minute presentations by different researchers about their science topics and then there's a pub trivia component at the end that's all astronomically themed and super fun. So I, I encourage you to, to check those out. Again, we will be continuing those into January um, and, 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 and hopefully into perpetuity, but we'll see. Uh, but we have all the recordings of our previous live stream streams on our YouTube channel. So you're welcome to check those out and see both the Astronomy on Tap series as well as, as the Stargazing Lecture series. So, um, okay, so... Let's let's get started with things. Liam, do you wanna do you wanna join me? Hey, Welcome, Aaron. sir. Nice Thank to see you. you. Likewise. I like your 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 starry background. Very Vincent Van Gogh there. Yeah, it's, it's like yours, but lower res. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, do you want to uh, do you wanna share your your screen? Sure. Thanks for joining us tonight. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, go ahead and and uh, and full screen it. And I think, oh yeah, that looks that looks great. Okay, so um, Dr. Liam Connor is a Canadian astrophysicist who started as a Tolman postdoctoral fellow at Caltech in the fall of 2020. Prior to that, he lived in the Netherlands, working at the University of Amsterdam. Liam received his PhD in 2016 from the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics at the University of Toronto, uh, where he began as a cosmologist, but transitioned to fast radio bursts, the content of his presentation tonight, uh, halfway through his doctorate. He also works at the interface of artificial intelligence and astronomy, building new machine learning tools to better understand the universe. In his free time, Liam likes backcountry skiing, puppet stop motion, and tending to his silky chickens. Um, puppet stop motion, I love puppet stop motion. So. I will have to check out some of your work because that sounds super amazing. 
Yeah, we should collaborate for sure. Yeah, that, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> um, okay, I'll let you. I'll let you take it from here. But thanks for joining us tonight, Liam. Okay, thank you, Cameron, and thanks for for uh, coming, everybody else. So in 2007, a uh, very bright radio pulse was detected by this telescope Parkes in Australia. This pulse was extremely bright. It was brief. It only lasted for about a millisecond. And it ended up becoming sort of one of the biggest outstanding mysteries in modern astrophysics. The reason it was so anomalous and special is that it seemed to come from really, really far away. So we see little flashes like this sometimes. They can come from the sun or from our own Milky Way, but these pulses seem to come from billions of light years away. And so the question is, the big mystery is, what could produce something that's so energetic that you could see it from halfway across the observable universe, but which is so common that they're of order 10,000 across the sky every day? So radio telescopes typically look at a fairly small patch of the sky. That's definitely true of parks. Um, and so just this one pulse that they detected in 2007 seemed to imply that there were thousands uh, each day, which means one every eight or so seconds or a few hundred over the course of this talk. So this pulse, this, this thing that Duncan Lorimer discovered in 2007 um, was the first ever fast radio burst. And the purpose of tonight's lecture is to sort of walk you through uh, what's been a very rapid and, in my opinion, exciting history of this field. So uh, as, as Cameron mentioned, I sort of started working on fast radio bursts halfway through my PhD. So I've had a front row seat and I, I've, I've been privileged to watch it all unfold and even play a small role in uh, helping unravel this mystery. Okay, so this is the pulse that was detected in 2007. This is called the Lorimer burst because it was discovered by an astronomer called Duncan Lorimer. So this probably just looks like noise, but what you're looking at here is the FRB itself. So the vertical axis is radio frequency or the wavelength of the light. The horizontal axis is time. And you can see that at lower frequencies, the pulse arrives slightly later than at high frequencies. So you get this characteristic sort of sweep of the pulse. And the reason this happens is due to a phenomenon called dispersion. So radio waves, just like any electromagnetic radiation travels at the speed of light. That's true for X-rays, that's true for photons from the sun, that's true for, for radio waves that you receive with your car antenna. But that's actually only true in a vacuum. So, once these radio waves start to travel through ionized plasma, which it turns out the universe is full of, there's gonna be a very slight delay because those waves are gonna travel a little bit more slowly than the speed of light. And it turns out that long wavelengths or low frequencies uh, travel ever so slightly more slowly than high frequencies, which leads to this characteristic sweep. Oh, whoops. Now this is a really small effect. Okay, so the FRB, if it comes from say 3 billion light years away, it travels for 3 billion years before it arrives at our telescope. And the delay between the top and the bottom of our band is only about uh, half a second, as you can see here. But it's really informative, even though it's a very small effect. Uh, it tells us A, how far away the fast radio burst is, and B, how much stuff it encountered along the line of sight. So it's sort of counting up electrons as it travels over this cosmological distance. By the way, the Lorimer burst had quite a bit of pop cultural cachet in the end. This is uh, a band from Hanover, Germany called Lorimer Burst. They make, I guess, instrumental uh, post-rock music. They're pretty good. You know, they've had a big impact on me, as you can see from my Spotify wrapped. Um, this is a joke. My, my Spotify wrapped is much more embarrassing than this, but if you check out their album, Dispersion, I think you'll agree they're they're pretty good. Okay, so between 2007 and about 2011, there was something of an FRB winter where no new event was discovered. There were no new fast radio bursts being detected. And so people started to wonder, you know, might this original one have been uh, terrestrial interference or somehow not real, not astronomical. Fortunately, this changed in 2013, four more were discovered. 
But there was still a problem, which was that all of these FRBs had been discovered by the same telescope. They'd all been discovered by Parks in Australia. Um, and the universe should really look the same, whether you're observing in Canada or South America or Australia. So it was a little peculiar that other telescopes around the world had not discovered fast radio bursts. And to make matters worse, um, Parks kept finding these things called paratons, which were kind of masquerading as FRBs. They, weren't, they clearly weren't real astronomical transients, uh, but they looked a lot like them. I'm showing a few here. Um, the way it worked is with the optics of the telescope, you can kind of tell what's in what we call the far field, really distant, and what's uh, in the near field, maybe at the observatory or somewhere in New South Wales. And these clearly were coming from close to the telescope. So it took some pretty heroic uh, investigative work by my friend and, and collaborator, Dr. Emily Petroff during her PhD. And she did these experiments and she showed that all of these paratons that were being discovered showed up suspiciously close to lunchtime. They're all around noon. And so doing some more experimental field work, they uh, opened and closed the microwave oven door prematurely. And they showed that when you do that, uh, you let off this little sweep of radio emission. And these were the source of the paratons. Okay, and around that time, you, you, you might think that this sort of called into question FRBs in general, but it actually more or less solidified our belief that they're real because the FRBs showed up at random times throughout the day and they appeared to be coming from very far, far away in the far field of the instrument. Around that time, another telescope started finding them as well. And this of course was further confirmation because the iconic Arecibo Observatory, which I'm showing here, did not have a microwave oven in the observatory. So we found this FRB. You probably know that um, Arecibo collapsed last year, tragically, after 60 years of doing really world leading science. And I think 57 years of being the largest telescope in the world, uh, it collapsed and is no longer in use but it did some terrific science along the way. It found this fast radio burst and it was exciting because it's the first fast radio burst ever seen to repeat. So up until this point, you would see it go off, you would focus on the same patch of sky where you found the original burst and you would never see anything. So people were wondering if these were gonna be you know, truly once off events that you'll never see go off again, or if they're gonna be more like pulsars and they'll give off multiple bursts. So this one gave off multiple bursts and it did so fairly erratically. So it would shut off for long periods and be dormant. And then it would turn on again and become uh, incredibly active. And because it was a repeater, we were able to put other telescopes on it and really zoom in on it and pinpoint the galaxy from which it came. So this is the first galaxy for which, or this is the first FRB for which a host galaxy was pinpointed. It turns out it was coming from a really vast distance, a cosmological distance, a, couple, a few billion light years away. And it lived in this strange little star forming galaxy. And within that galaxy, it lived in a very, very special place, which was highly magnetized and full of plasma, a really, really kind of violent and dense environment. Okay, so thus far, we, we've only talked about the phenomena of FRBs, what they look like, how we observe them. We haven't actually discussed what they might be. So here's a long list. This is a, a very incomplete list of the zoo of theoretical models for fast radio bursts. We used to have this joke that was true back then that there were more theories for FRBs than actual FRBs. And uh, happily that's, that's no longer the case. But you can imagine if you have a couple of dozen mutually contradicting theories for what an FRB is, and they cannot all be right, but they can all be wrong. So either one of these is correct or none of them is. So just to walk through a couple of them, a fairly popular idea early on was that you could maybe get a little blast of radio waves from two coalescing compact objects. So suppose you have say two neutron stars or two white dwarfs orbiting each other. Eventually they're gonna crash into each other in this fairly violent explosion. And you could imagine maybe getting a radio spark out of that. Now, these class of models kind of got called into question because you'll remember at least one FRB at this point is known to repeat. 
And it's pretty hard to have a repeating source if you destroy it in the process. So the, these class of models are considered cataclysmic, which means whatever is producing the FRB kind of explodes in the process. Um, whereas if you're gonna have a, a repeating FRB, you really want the thing to stick around and, and keep giving off more pulses. The model that I and others uh, was a proponent of um, argues that FRBs come from the ma uh, magnetospheres of neutron stars. So neutron stars are really interesting objects. They're what's left behind if you explode a massive star, but aren't massive enough to form a black hole. So you take more than a, a solar mass and you collapse it into the size of Manhattan. So you can imagine this is an extremely dense um, an energetic object, a spoonful of it weighs as much as Mount Everest, for example, and it's got a really strong magnetic field. So if you have plasma or any kind of material in that magnetic field, you can accelerate it and end up generating radio waves and making a radio pulse. But there are some much more exciting models out there. So for example, uh, one group claimed that it's evaporating primordial black holes, uh, axion stars, a bunch of different people thought it was asteroids crashing into maybe a neutron star or some other type of object giving off a little explosion. Some people thought it was dark matter induced collapse of neutron stars, um, Higgs portals to pulsar collapse. I don't even know what that one means, but it sounds really fun. Um, one of them really sticks out and it's this one here. And that's because it's the only one on this list that's artificial. So if I tell somebody on a plane uh, or at a bar, what I do, they'll ask, well, what do you specifically work on? And I say, well, there are these radio pulses that come from the other side of the universe, blah, blah, blah. And they'll inevitably ask, is it aliens? And so I have to let them down and say, no, it's probably something more mundane, like a magnetized neutron star at a cosmological distance in a dense environment, whatever. Um, but it's not a silly question. It's not a silly question at all. It's kind of the most profound question you can ask, are we alone in the universe? Uh, and that's in part because both answers to that question are kind of mind bending. So either we are alone in the universe, despite there being hundreds of billions of galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of stars with more than one uh, planet per star on average, or we're not alone. And that's of course, very exciting and troubling in its own way. So this model for FRBs, said that actually it's an artificial phenomenon. And what you're seeing are the kind of residual uh, radio emission when extraterrestrial civilizations are trying to power their light sails. So the idea is you wanna to try to accelerate some object with a light sail uh, up to near the speed of light. And you would do this with a co coherent radio burst. And what we're seeing on earth are the sort of residual light that's coming from that, the part that's missing the sail basically. Okay, so as I said, we shouldn't be dismissive and it's worth, it's worth asking in earnest whether or not FRBs could be ET. But before I do that, I wanna offer an example of history very much repeating itself. And that's with the discovery of pulsars or pulsating stars. So this is Jocelyn Bell, it's 1967. She's a graduate student in astronomy. And she notices this very strange thing in her data. She sees these little blips and they're repeating and they're repeating very, very regularly. So much so that uh, they're accurate to about one part, uh, one part in a millionth of a second every day. And on top of that, they're not, they're moving with the rest of the celestial sky. So they're clearly not, it's not a terrestrial source, but it's, it's extremely regular and it seems fairly artificial. So she goes and she tells her, her PhD supervisor, Anthony Hewish, as well as a prominent radio astronomer, Martin Ryle. And they try to figure out uh, what, what's the cause of this pulsating radio source. And because it seems so regular, they kind of jokingly call this thing LGM1 or Little Green Men 1. But it might've been less of a joke than, than you'd think. I, I heard this story secondhand granted, but apparently Martin Ryle's daughter was telling a story about how she uh, never talked to her father about work. 
He would never talk about it at the dinner table, but one night he was clearly really perturbed. And so they were pestering him, trying to explain what was wrong. And he finally broke and he said, something happened at work today, and I'm not sure if I should call the police, the military, uh, the prime minister or the queen. As you can imagine, if you really think you've made first contact, um, this is suddenly bigger than yourself and bigger than your little radio astronomy research project. Now, they found out fairly quickly that actually this was an alien. It was probably a rotating neutron star, which ended up being the correct uh, explanation. The idea is you have this rapidly rotating neutron star, which has beamed mission. And so you get a sort of lighthouse effect where anytime the beam of the lighthouse passes you, you get a little pulse. And because the neutron star spins so regularly, um, the pulses that you see are incredibly periodic. Um, you might recognize this, by the way, this, this is the origin of the very famous Joy Division album cover and all the subsequent t-shirts. This is pulse profiles from that first pulsar that they found, LGM1. I do also need to point out that um, Jocelyn Bell, despite having discovered the pulsars, was not awarded a Nobel Prize, where, whereas Tony Hewish and Martin Ryle both were, but uh, that's, that's kind of an injustice that deserves its own talk. Now, in the case of fast radio bursts, um, it's actually probably more obvious that it's not coming from aliens. Because if you think about it, FRBs are coming from really, really far away. So one is coming from 5 billion light years in that direction. One is com coming from 6 billion light years in that direction, which means those two galaxies and the civilizations they're in don't know about each other. And it's not just those two, they're happening all over the sky and all sorts of different galaxies. So you have to suppose that A, technologically advanced life is really, really common in the universe. And B, they've all converged on this very, on the, on the same very specific technology. There are other sort of technical reasons why FRBs wouldn't be an obvious choice if you're an intelligent alien civilization trying either to communicate or push a light sail. But I think the, the best explanation or the best reason to think that they're not aliens uh, comes from the fact that in the past couple of years, we, we basically figured out what they are, um, which is what the remaining part of my lecture is about. Okay, before I move on, um, I have to show this movie. So last night I got back from the um, Owens Valley Radio Observatory, OVRO, and there we're commissioning a um, radio telescope to find new fast radio bursts and localize them. So we decided to screen this movie from 1996 called The Arrival. We screened it because it was actually shot at OVRO. So there were lots of scenes from the, the building that we were actually working in. And by the way, this is, this is not to be confused with the Oscar award-winning movie Arrival, which is based on very good uh, science fiction short story um, by Ted Chang. This is The Arrival from 1996, starring Charlie Sheen. Uh, it was a massive box office flop, but I still recommend that you watch it. So here's a scene from the movie. This is the room that I was working in. We actually screened it from this, this room in which everything was filmed. And they find this, this mysterious pulse. And of course, in this case, it really is aliens. They take it, so, so Charlie Sheen, is this very disagreeable radio astronomer working at JPL. He takes it to the director of JPL and because it's Hollywood and, and all radio astronomy is done through earphones, he gives him a sample. Uh, it turns out the head of JPL is, is actually an alien himself. Um, and nobody really believes him, but th this is just too on the nose. So I, I had to show it. Oh God, we had a bell ringer this morning. Really good signal. I just, I just couldn't confirm it in time. Really good last year too. Turned out to be what a broken microwave oven. What's your point? So, whatever. Ten, twenty years before all this happened, Charlie Sheen already played out all of our lives in this movie, and it almost makes you feel like you're a background character in a bad '90s Charlie Sheen film. Um, except in his case, it really was aliens, which is very exciting. So anyway, I had to recreate this image. There's a simulated FRB in front of that telescope. 
uh, about 15 years later. Okay, back to fast radio bursts. So we've established that they're not aliens. In the last three or four years, the field has really accelerated. And the reason for that is telescopes all around the world have been built uh, primarily to search for them. So here's an example. This is now the largest single dish telescope in the world, FAST in China. There's ASCAP in Australia. This is of course the deep synoptic array that I just showed you at OVRO that we built here at Caltech. And then one that's very near and dear to my heart, CHIME, this is a telescope in, in Western Canada. It's a very unusual telescope. This is, this is what I spent my PhD doing, working on this uh, instrument. It's four parabolic cylinders side by side, each of which is about 300 feet long. And it ended up being, even though it wasn't built for the purpose of detecting fast radio bursts, it ended up being a really terrific machine for finding huge numbers of them. Here it is at night. You can imagine because it's in the Okanagan Valley in British Columbia, um, in the winter, it's got about a foot or two feet of snow on it. So they kind of turn into Olympic half pipes. Um, here it is. This is time in, in uh, Southern British Columbia. This is a, a satellite image of Canada. We've, we've labeled everything such that space observers can see where everything is. Um, Remember I told you at the beginning of the talk that we used to have more theories than models or more, more theories than actual FRBs. That's no longer the case. And, and this is in large part thanks to CHIME. So CHIME has now found a couple of thousand fast radio bursts. And a lot of those FRBs are repeaters. Several dozen are repeaters. And one of those repeaters is really interesting. So this one, it was localized to a galaxy not all that far away, sort of a Milky Way-like galaxy. It lives in the spiral arm. So this repeater is special because it repeats in a very periodic way. So it's on for about two or three days and it's very active during those two or three days. And then it's totally silent for two more weeks and then it turns on again. So if the problem of figuring out what FRBs were was not hard enough, we now have to figure out why the system has built into it a sort of very rigid 16.3 day clock. A natural explanation, a natural first start, is that whatever is emitting the FRB is in a binary orbit. So a tight binary orbit, you could have, maybe it would be about 16 days long, maybe the wind of the companion star gets in the way of the burst or something. Another explanation comes from Einstein. So in Einstein's theory of general relativity, you get something called precession, where the spin axis of say a free neutron star can kind of wobble a little bit. So again, you might have this beaming effect where only two out of 16 days uh, is the beam pointed at you, but really this is still a mystery. We, we don't know what's causing the periodicity in this one repeating fast radio burst. Okay, the, la the last major discovery that I'm gonna talk about in this field was made in April of 2020. It was actually quite a big leap forward in our understanding of what was causing fast radio bursts. And it was made by this telescope here. So it's not the fancy one in the background. It's not the two white ones in the background. It's just this antenna in the foreground. It's literally an antenna pointed at the sky. There's no dish. There's no fancy electronics. It's very low budget. In this photo, you're seeing it correctly. There is literally a trash can on top of uh, the antenna acting as a ray dome, protecting it from weather. And the purpose of this instrument, which is called STAIR, which was built uh, by a graduate student here at Caltech called uh, Chris Bohenek, the purpose is to just constantly be searching the sky for a fast radio burst that comes from our own galaxy. Remember that until this point, it has been a purely extragalactic phenomenon and nothing came from within even a hundred million light years of the Milky Way galaxy. And I must say, when I first heard about this project, I was still working in the Netherlands. I was still living in Amsterdam. And I thought, you know, that's a cute idea and somebody should do it, but they're never gonna see anything. It's not gonna work. It was a very um, high reward situation. But in April, 2020, sure enough, a burst, a fast radio burst from our own galaxy went off and STAIR was right there to find it. And so a bunch of other telescopes, including space-based X-ray telescopes, zoomed in on it, 
And this FRB seemed to come from a highly magnetized neutron star, otherwise known as a magnetar. So this was really the final nail in all those in the coffin of all those other theories that didn't involve uh, a neutron star and really made this very strong and profound connection between magnetars, which we already knew about, and this extragalactic ph phenomenon of fast radio bursts. Inspired by this, I and a couple of colleagues have proposed a successor experiment to STAIR. It's called G-REX, or the Galactic Radio Explorer. So our plan is, again, just have an antenna pointed at the sky all the time, but make it more sensitive, cover five times more radio bandwidth, and place little clusters of antennas all around the world. So for STAIR 2, they were, for STAIR, they were only in the southwestern United States. Our plan is to plop one in India, Western Australia, Western Europe, Argentina, and, and all over the United States to just build this sort of global network of telescopes, always searching for galactic FRBs. And hopefully we'll find maybe a dozen or so per year. Okay, so in just over 10 years, we've gone from not knowing that FRBs exist to wondering if they're terrestrial interference, maybe they come from microwave ovens, maybe they're exploding black holes, maybe they're aliens, to now knowing with a fairly high degree of certainty that they come from uh, magnetized neutron stars. So you might think we can all you know, collectively go home, we solve the problem, we can uh, leave astronomy and pursue more you know, maybe practical or lucrative careers. Um, but in my opinion, the, the, the fun is kind of just beginning. And that's because there's always been this hope to put FRBs to use, to, to probe and study other more fundamental aspects of the universe. So you can imagine if you have these, these sort of skewers or these probes along many different lines of sight, thousands per day, thousands of new lines of sight per day, each of which tells you something about all the invisible material between you and the emitting source. So FRBs, because they're so narrow and because there are so many of them, end up being a really good probe of the dark matter in the universe, the, the electron mist through which an FRB travels, which causes the dispersion delay, and all sorts of other things. So there's uh, a really exciting future for fast radio bursts um, in their application to fundamental physics and cosmology. Anyway, I hope I've convinced you that this has been uh, an exciting history and, and that FRBs also have a, a really cool future to look forward to. So let me thank you and then I'm happy to take questions. Awesome. Great presentation, Liam. Thank you very much. Oh, I have, I have a clapper here and I, when I applaud for you, it, it sets off my, my clapper that turns on a light and makes some noise. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, uh, excellent presentation. And yeah, I encourage audience members to ask questions um, in, the, in the chat uh, interface and but as I, as I mentioned before, we'll take questions not just on the content of what Liam discussed, but questions on any kind of astrophysical or space science or physics or astronomy topics that, that you may have or questions that you may have. Um, and it'll be, there's, there are four of us who will try and respond to them. So um, let me invite the other two members of our Q&A panel, Nicole and Stephanie, do you wanna turn on your, your cameras and your microphone? Welcome team. Let me uh, welcome everybody. Oh, there's Stephanie. Great. Um, so, so yeah, uh, here is our, our full Q and a panel that you're welcome to ask questions of. Um, can I just have uh, Nicole and Stephanie, do you guys want to take a minute to kind of introduce yourself and what sort of science that you work on just to let our audience know what, what your specialties are. So that might kind of prime their, their questions to be relevant to, to our specialties. Nicole, do you want to start? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Wallach. I'm a PhD candidate at Caltech, specifically in planetary science. So I study protoplanetary disks, which are the disks around stars that planets form out of, like those in our solar system. And I also study the atmospheres of extrasolar planets, which are planets outside of the solar system, basically just to try to understand how planets form and how they evolve, to learn more about how our solar system came to be the way it is. You can feel free to ask me anything about exoplanets, planet formation, the objects that are in my Zoom background. I'm tempting anyone to ask about uh, brown dwarfs is what these are. Um, so yeah, please feel free to ask me anything about planetary science. Thanks, Nicole. Um, Stephanie, would you like to introduce yourself as well? 
Yeah, hi, I am Stephanie Deppa. I am uh, a recovering academic. Uh, <laughs> I no longer work in a university or academia. I'm currently the astronomy content strategist at the Vera Rubin Observatory. So my job is basically um, taking all of the cool science that the observatory will do when it turns on in 2024 and sharing it with everybody in the public. Um, but my academic background, my PhD was also in planetary science and physics. Um, and I used a project called the Dark Energy Survey to find and study new objects in the Kuiper Belt region uh, in our solar system out beyond Neptune. Cool, very cool. Maybe I'll have some questions for you too. Um, and I'm uh, I'm Cameron Hummels. I do computational uh, studies of how galaxies form and evolve. So I primarily run big computer simulations on supercomputers to analyze how how galaxies form, how they evolve, and how they they continue to to fuel their 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 star formation from the accretion of, of gas flows in between galaxies and over cosmological structures and how that how that plays out, how how that fuels star formation, which then turns into stars and some of those stars erupt in supernovae and blow that material out into the outskirts of the galaxy and kind of start the whole process over and over again. So um, that's that's primarily what I work on, although I'm writing a paper right now with Liam on, on fast radio bursts and what the computer simulations predict about the distribution of matter that can change that, uh, that dispersion measure, that delay time that those pulses coming from those distant objects, when they're arriving at us, that's, that's influenced by the amount of stuff in the way. And I'm making predictions about how much stuff is in the way based on the simulations. So, um, so I know a little bit, but he's definitely the the authority on all things fast radio burst. So, um, so yeah, please ask your questions. I, I already see a lot that are that are here in the chat, but I encourage people to um, to continue to ask them. So, firstly, a question from Andrew Reitemeyer, uh, primary for primarily for Liam. Could gravitational wave, excuse me, could gravitational wave observations be used to investigate fast radio bursts? Yeah, so there was some hope that this would be the case back when uh, all those other models were still viable. So any models that uh, suggested FRBs were coming from two colliding neutron stars, for example, or maybe a neutron star with a black hole, that would have been right for gravitational wave observations because uh, such a cataclysmic event would give off lots of gravitational waves. So maybe you would see one coincident with an FRB. Uh, the fact that we now think they come from probably uh, lone neutron stars, maybe neutron stars and tight binaries, means it probably won't coincide with gravitational wave emission. That makes sense. Um, another question from Peter Dwork. Given the angular resolution limitations of radio telescopes, is it challenging to pinpoint the source of a fast radio burst to a single star billions of light years away? Yeah, absolutely. So to really, to get good spatial resolution in the radio, you really need an interferometer. Uh, so Parks is a single dish, it's not an interferometer, it's got very poor resolution. But a lot of the, the um, surveys that are coming online today, including the one that I was just working on in the Owens Valley, are interferometers and they will be able to pinpoint the FRB to its host galaxy. Cannot pinpoint to its host star, this is way too tiny, especially because these things are coming from cosmological distances, uh, but yeah, ba basically you need a large interferometer. That makes sense. Um, one question that I had based on the, what you were discussing was, um, I know you, you, you talked about the peritons that were ultimately found to be from, from like a faulty microwave oven that gave a similar signal for the radio telescopes to what these distant, you know, explosions in space are. Um, was there... You kind of alluded to it, but was there a, a distinct difference in the signal that was coming from the nearby microwave oven that was opening too soon versus these distant, uh, you know, magnetars in other galaxies? Was it? Yeah. You, you alluded to like, you could tell that some were far field and some were near field, but how did that play yeah. out actually in the signal? Yeah, there, there was actually something 
there was something else that was different about the signal, which is that, you know, that characteristic sweep I showed where the FRB arrives a little bit later at low frequencies. Um, it follows a very specific mathematical rule, which is that the time delay goes like wavelength squared. Okay. For the paratons, that was not the case. They kind of deviated from that very specific law. So that's why people were suspicious. But on top of that, um, they were showing up in kind of multiple places in the radio image. Specifically, they were showing up in lots of different beams, which an astronomical object does not. Okay. Okay. And that would only be true of a local object that could show up in side lobes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Well, yeah, it makes for a good story. That's also amazing, the whole thing about the Charlie Sheen film. I have not seen that film. I've been wanting to see this movie called The Arrival, but I had no idea, no idea that it like predicted the whole periton phenomena being responsible from, it was, from it was Michael totally crazy. <laughs> we, we were it was it was two nights ago and we were watching that movie and we were all just howling because like obviously it's so hammy and it's so corny, but also everything that <laughs> happened except for except for the aliens was except sort for of the different. aliens. Yet, yet. <laughs> I was gonna say it's it's the aliens that made that movie and they knew what was gonna happen. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. That's right. They, they made it flop so as to discredit the idea. <laughs> um, so another question about um, fast radio bursts. But remember, everyone can ask questions about uh, anything that may be, may be plaguing them in terms of they have a question about, you know, uh, news about anything in the news about space or whatnot. We can try and we can try and address. But uh, a question from Joe Hebert. Would there be any benefits to scanning for fast radio bursts from other astronomical sites that are non-terrestrial, like the surface of the moon? I know, uh, you know, there have been references in the past to to potential benefits from building telescopes, both radio telescopes as well as visible wavelength telescopes on the surface of the moon for various reasons. Would that would that benefit this particular topic or or um, search in any way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean. If you, if you put the Deep Synoptic Array or CHIME or any telescope looking for FRBs on the dark side of, of the moon, our life would get so much easier. You know, there's, there's no uh, radio reflecting or radio emitting satellites that you can see. There are no microwave ovens. There's no radio frequency interference in general. Um, and so the data would just be that much cleaner. Um, if you want to be really ambitious, you could go to super low frequencies that you can't see from Earth. You know, the, the ionosphere is opaque below 10 or something, 10 or 15 megahertz, which means you just can't observe at those frequencies. Uh, so you could do that on the moon. We bump up against that, that bottom limit of frequencies with the fast radio burst pulse that, that we see? No, that's why I'd be ambitious. N oh, nothing's, been, nothing's been seen below 100 megahertz, but who knows? And where's the, the ionosphere puts up kind of a, a lower limit on the frequencies that we can get because there's all these, just to make sure everybody understands, the ionosphere is, is essentially, and correct me if I mess this up, but um, it's essentially the upper atmosphere, uh, the, are there just free electrons up there that are basically, yeah. there's a plasma up there that's bouncing around and it prevents, it's like a barrier to radio waves. So people who are ham radio operators here on the surface of the earth can kind of send something to a distant radio tower by bouncing off the, the atmosphere and then bouncing back down to the earth and kind of bouncing around to a place that you wouldn't normally be able to access on the surface of the earth because of this kind of ceiling that we have. But it also prevents signals from going through that ceiling from extraterrestrial sources to here. Is that exactly? Yeah. yeah. So what at what wavelength or what frequency does that start to become a barrier that we can't see through? You said the lower limit that FRBs have, have had their pulse is about 100 megahertz. Is, yeah. is that around where the ionosphere starts to cut things off or is that? No, in, in that case, I mean, the, the thing that hurts us in general is plasma, whether, whether it's in the ionosphere or in the interstellar medium of the Milky Way. But you get this thing called scattering, which kind of spreads out the pulse. Um, and so things just get a lot harder at these low frequencies, basically. And of course, the dispersion delay, remember I showed that, that swoop. At 100 megahertz, you have to wait like three minutes for the end of the pulse to show up because it's this wavelength dependent effect. So wow. in, in the Netherlands, we had this experiment where 
we were gonna detect FRBs at 1400 megahertz and then detect them with a telescope called LOFAR at 100 megahertz. And you could basically go and make yourself a cup of coffee while the rest of the pulse showed up because you had a couple of minutes just from the dispersion delay. That's wild. Yeah. Um, uh, do the same cosmic phenomena that emit fast radio bursts, this is a question from Imran Bouli, do the same cosmic phenomena that emit fast radio bursts also emit other waves in other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that can be de detected with other instruments? Or is it just, just this portion of the radio spectrum that, that emits and we can detect light from? Yeah, so a lot of telescope resources, especially early on, were put into this uh, electromagnetic follow-up. So follow-up at other wavelengths, optical, x-ray, and so on. And for extragalactic FRBs, nothing has ever been found. Now, in part, this is probably just because um, an x-ray telescope, for example, doesn't probe that large of a volume of the universe. It's not quite as sensitive in a sense as, um, as at other wavelengths. However, the galactic FRB that Chris Bohennick discovered with STAIR, it did give off a, a pretty powerful high energy uh, x-ray burst. So yeah, we will probably find an electromagnetic counterpart uh, at a shorter wavelength than radio, but it hasn't happened yet for the extragalactic ones. I see. And that, but that may just be that they aren't as close. So they aren't as bright. So we aren't be able to detect them. I suspect that's right. I, th I think when we find one, that's like, I don't know, in M31, for example. Just for reference. Yeah. So everyone knows what M31 is. M31 yeah. is the Andromeda galaxy that you probably know from any Mac computer, it's default background is, is, uh, is M31 and it's our nearest giant galaxy uh, yeah, to yeah. us. So it's, so it's nearby. So if something happened in it, it would be very, very bright and we'd potentially exactly. see yeah. it. I think it will happen. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I guess this takes me back to a question I had during your talk and that was um, you referenced how when Chris Behenick had his had built this instrument, um, stare that is stares at kind of the 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 sky, you didn't mm -hmm. really expect that it would be able to see that it would be able to detect things. Um, was that just because it wasn't able to to detect very faint objects, and so it had to be really bright in order for it to detect it? Is that why you didn't expect it to find something? Yeah, I didn't expect it to see anything because even though FRBs are very common on the sort of cosmological scale, for an individual galaxy, the rate is maybe one, or the rate I had in my head was maybe one per century per galaxy. So I thought, you know, Chris was gonna have to get really lucky to see anything. I think um, the, the fault in my reasoning was that there's sort, of a, there, there's sort of a continuum of luminosities. So they can be really energetic or a little bit energetic, whatever. Um, which meant that you could potentially see sort of a medium luminous one. And it's not that unlikely that it would live in the Milky Way. Um, yeah. But it was, it was a tremendous discovery. I mean, like, yeah, you know, I know, um, uh, Chris, it was pretty amazing that a, a PhD candidate was like making this, this groundbreaking research and mm -hmm. he's since left the field, unfortunately for all of us. Probably fortunately for him, um, but uh, but yeah, he 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 left the field. I think he's doing data science now. So yeah, good for whoever he went to work for. But sad for the rest of us in astronomy. Good job. You know, I think I think he actually felt like you know my work here is done. Basically, <laughs> I could never do anything greater than this discovery. <laughs> he, yeah. he peaked early in academia. Right. Time to get yeah. out while he was ahead. Jump the shark. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So there is a question here from Andrew Reitemeyer. Question about exoplanets. How much can we learn about the internal structures of exoplanets um, and, and through what means, through what kind of observations tell us about what's, what's happening inside of, a, of an exoplanet? I think this one's probably appropriate for, for you, Nicole, maybe Stephanie as well. Yeah, um, I can jump off if you want to jump in after uh, or even during. Um, so yeah, the thing about exoplanets in general is that it's really hard to get any real information about them, to be honest. Specifically exoplanets, we can learn a lot more about the solar system and maybe Stephanie can speak more to that. 
Uh, I'm definitely an extrasolar person, um, but we really have a hard time gauging what's going on in the interior structure of exoplanets. For one, most of the planets that we've discovered are gas giants, things that are like Jupiter, for example, and they're super gaseous. And that's pretty much what we can determine about them. We can kind of get a first handle on their atmospheric compositions, which then encodes some information about the way that they form, but the actual internal structure is quite hard. There's a lot of degeneracies that go on with mass and radius specifically. Um, you can't even always get the radius and the mass for certain objects. So there's different methods of detecting extrasolar planets, and they kind of give us different amounts of information about different types of objects, basically. So the transit method, which is when the planet passes in front of the host star and you block out the planet, blocks out the star's light, you can get the radius of the object, but you don't get any real information about the mass. The radial velocity method, which uses the Doppler shift, does give you mass information. But the problem is you can't always get both for every object. And that's kind of what you need to understand the bulk compositions of these objects. So if you just have a radius and you can kind of gauge something about the atmospheric composition, it has a lot of hydrogen or something like that, you can try to get a handle on what's going on in the interior, but it's really difficult. And we really don't know. We get a lot of that information from the solar system actually. So maybe Stephanie, if you wanna to speak to a little bit about the way we've done that. Yeah, so I was just going to say that um, even in our own solar system, we're still learning about the interiors of planets. Like we don't know, and, and we can send missions to planets around our own uh, planets in our solar system. And we don't even know like what the, I mean, we only in the last few years have we really learned what like the, the center of Jupiter is like in the center of Saturn. Um, so it's going to be a long time, I think, before we get that kind of information for exoplanets. How do we how do we learn that stuff about the stuff in our own solar system about the interior structure? Is it is it? I mean, I guess we haven't been to Jupiter, and and there's not we, it's not like we can land on the surface of Jupiter because it's it's basically just the tops of the clouds of the atmosphere. So how do we how do we learn about that structure? Yeah, yeah. So the Juno mission, which is currently in orbit around Jupiter, is one of my favorite missions of all time. Um, it's it's a super cool little probe that is orbiting Jupiter in a polar orbit, which is a little bit unusual. So usually missions will orbit the planet in like the same plane that the planet is rotating. Um, but Juno, so if Jupiter is rotating sort of this way, Juno is orbiting around the poles. And the reason they're doing that is so they can get really accurate measurements of what the gravity field of Jupiter is like, like super, super, super precise measurements of what the gravity field of Jupiter is like. And that tells you how the mass inside Jupiter, including going all the way down into the center, how that mass is distributed. And so what they've learned from the Juno like gravity field data is that the the core of Jupiter is not a solid thing. It's not like you you go down through the cloud tops and then there's a solid surface to stand on it. it it's very diffuse. And so it like at some point is really solid, but then it sort of like diffuses and fades into the clouds. And then eventually like at some point you're now in the clouds of Jupiter, but there's no like real hard line of where that happens. Um, and so that, I mean, the Juno spacecraft uh, is a super cool mission. If you don't know anything about it, really encourage looking into it, but um, that's, that's what we've learned. And that's been in the last like five or so years that we've learned that. Yeah, cool. it's really interesting, actually, um, specifically because of Juno. So I'm a sixth year graduate student finishing up. So when I started graduate school, I remember that we had a conversation in my planetary interiors class about whether Jupiter had a core. It was still up for debate because we weren't sure. We didn't know if it was a solid core, if it had no core at all. And the importance of a core is actually goes back to planet formation. So we think that these planets like Jupiter need to form a core before they can get enough gas and start accreting gas from their protoplanetary disk, which I mentioned before, is just sort of the gas and dust disk around a star. So we think that an object needs to have a core, a big enough core to start accreting enough gas from that solar disk to actually form a giant planet like Jupiter. But we had no real idea what the interior looked like. Like, okay, we think that it should be this way. We have no clue. And it was really Juno and a lot of the solar system science that kind of gives us really excellent insight into what we expect to see with the extrasolar planets. Not always do, but what we should expect to see if you know all exoplanets are like the solar system. Constantly evolving, I think, is one of my favorite parts about this kind of astronomy. We know, I know there was a another mission recently, um, in some ways akin to the Juno mission called Cassini that was orbiting around Saturn. Did Saturn, did, did Cassini reveal similar details about the interior of Saturn to what you were describing for Juno, kind of this like solid, but then kind of like tenuous diffuse structure before it turned into the cloudy components of the atmosphere? 
Yeah, so I think Cassini was not originally designed to measure that, but somebody went back after the Cassini mission ended and like sort of retroactively did that measurement. And I think they also found that the core was sort of similar, but I could be getting that wrong. I'm not totally sure. I don't remember, but I do remember that somebody, I, I'm pretty sure someone went back retroactively after the mission ended and did that measurement. Interesting. Super cool. Okay. Thanks guys. Um, we have a question, lots of questions, lots of great questions. We'll try to get to all of them one by one. Um, the next one comes from friend Scott Derwinson Peacock asking, will the James Webb Space Telescope be able to resolve an exoplanet's image directly? Like take an actual picture of an exoplanet? Yeah, the idea is yes. Um, actually, we can do that even from the ground now. We have a, not as many directly imaged exoplanets as we do sort of for the transiting method or for the radial velocity method. So there's just a handful of them because as you'd expect, it's really hard to image a really faint thing next to a really bright thing. So the planet is gonna be really faint next to a star, which is really big and bright, uh, but we can do it from the ground even. So yeah, there are a handful of objects that we expect to be able to do with JWST. Um, but yeah, there's you know bigger telescopes that are being built even on the ground. So that's that's actually what I work on in addition is direct imaging of exoplanets and proplanet disks from the ground specifically. I'm a fan of, of ground-based astronomy. Ground-based astronomy. <laughs> easier to do on the ground, less well, expensive. Less expensive. I don't know if it's easier because of well, the Well, okay. <laughs> that's true. There are definitely things that are much easier to do from space, but... Um... Weather is a problem. Weather is really yeah. hard. <laughs> um, Related to that, we have another question from the nerdy walker about James Webb, but with relation to fast radio bursts. And the question is, how will the James Webb Space Telescope, which fingers crossed will launch in less than two weeks from South America, um, how will it help us in our understanding of the sources of fast radio bursts, or can they only be detected from radio telescopes? I guess you so, kind of alluded to, to some of this before when we talked about, you said that that there had been an X-ray signal associated with one of these one of these fast radio bursts. Is there ever yeah. a thought for any of these models of magnetars or whatnot that there might be an infrared uh, wavelength emission coming from that sort of object? object? Not, not prompt emission. So I don't think you'll, it'll help at all with the transient. So the the burst itself. Mm -hmm. However, it'll be super useful for following up and trying to figure out just where in the galaxy, in the host galaxy it lives and what that environment is like. So for example, Hubble has been, I mean, it's, it's different wavelengths of course, but Hubble has been super useful for unveiling the sort of very uh, near vicinity of fast radio burst emitting sources. Um, but to actually detect prompt emission, the, the burst itself, you need uh, really high cadence data. You need like millisecond data. Um, oh. and so, to, to ever do this in optical or IR, uh, you would need a very special instrument. I see, wow, it's that prompt. It's, it's okay, directly following. And I guess related to that, and you talked a little bit about this with gravitational waves, would there be any hope of seeing other multi-messenger signals like from neutrinos or, or, um, or cosmic rays associated with this? That would be really cool. That would be really cool. I don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah, I know pe people have definitely speculated on a, neutri a neutrino, sign neutrino signature um, or high energy uh, cosmic rays. Don't know how plausible any of that is, but that'd be really nice. Um, there's a question about the ETA for, for detection of more of these systems of the fast radio bursts. Can you talk about some of the new instruments that are kind of coming out? You, you alluded to CHIME, this wonderful instrument that, that's been extremely productive that actually wasn't even built for doing fast radio burst detections is, and has kind of been co-opted in some ways to doing all of this groundbreaking science. Yeah. Um, can you talk about any of the other new instruments that are, that are being put out to be able to, to detect these in the future? Yeah, for sure. So Chime itself is getting an upgrade. And now that they know about FRBs and they know how well they can detect them, um, this, this sort of successor to Chime, which is called CORD, um, is going to focus a lot on localizing huge numbers of them. So CORD is going to be a large interferometer. There's going to be one station in British Columbia. I think there's going to be one in West Virginia. And so you're going to have this sort of trans-North American uh, interferometer. 
Uh, we here at Caltech are building the deep synoptic array, which I showed a video of, which will localize FRBs. Um, we're also hoping to build the DSA 2000, which would be a really powerful telescope made up of 2000 little mini telescopes, 2000 different antennas. In the far future, the thing I want to build, or I want somebody to build anyway, is what I would call an omniscope, where you can sort of see in all directions, at all frequencies, at all times. So the idea is get rid of the dish altogether, basically take those stair antennas that, um, that Chris was using, but put them in a big array and form an actual, what, what you'd call a coherent telescope. So it'd be as sensitive as Chime, but looking over the entire sky 24 seven. And once you've done that, then you can, that the sort of the final FRB telescope. You see all of them all the time. Everything, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> How large of a aperture do you need to be able to, to build something like that? I think to match the collecting area of Chime, have the same sensitivity per pixel on the sky, you need about 15 or 20,000 antennas. So it'd be a massive computing challenge. You, know, you, you need like a couple couple foldings of Moore's law to actually get there. But uh, yeah, it's probably gonna happen. Uh, let's see. Just a point of clarification for Sanjay uh, Sahani. So after all, what is the source of a fast radio burst? Is it a magnetar or is it something else? Magnetars. Okay. Magnetars. Of course, it's possible that some of them are created by something more exotic, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess with gamma ray bursts, we have two different mechanisms that can produce gamma ray bursts, you know, like the short gamma ray burst and the long gamma ray burst come from slightly different things. So yeah, perhaps yeah. there's like multiple mechanisms that generate this, but at least what you're saying here is the science points towards it being this highly magnetic neutron star that's the generation mechanism that we've witnessed. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I would say the most likely candidate for all of them is magnetars, but it's definitely possible that, you know, maybe you have neutron stars in other environments, maybe old recycled neutron stars can somehow do this. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, that's very exciting. Um, here is a question. And that I think is probably appropriate for our planet people. And there's a question, what is planet nine? People have read about this a lot uh, recently in the news. So um, perhaps Stephanie, since you work on solar system stuff, you'd want to address, what is planet nine? Tell us, reveal the secrets. Mm, yes. Well, maybe you'll have to talk to the aliens for that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so planet nine is a um, still hypothetical planet in our solar system. We haven't found it yet, um, but it is essentially on a several thousand year orbit, if it exists. Um, it's well beyond the orbit of Neptune. It's much farther away than, say, Neptune or Pluto. Um, and the reason that uh, we think it, it might exist is because the most distant Kuiper Belt objects in our solar system, so these icy asteroid type things that orbit the sun out beyond Neptune, um, the, the most distant of these, the ones that have the longest orbits that take the longest to go around the sun that we know about, um, they seem like they're all pointed, like their orbits are all pointed in the same direction in space. And that's kind of weird because uh, something that that far out um, with, with no other sort of forces on it, no planets shepherding its motion or you know telling it where to go. Um, we would expect them to be sort of randomly distributed in the outer solar system, but they're not. They look like they're sort of all in the same area. Um, and so actually two astronomers at Caltech, uh, Mike Brown and Constantine Teigen, propose that the reason that these orbits all look like they're pointed in the same direction in space is because they are actually being shepherded by a planet out there. It's just one that we haven't found yet. And so they call this planet, Planet Nine. Um, ironically, because Mike Brown is the, the reason that Pluto is no longer a planet. So it's a little bit of a, a nod to that. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's 
Planet Nine is basically, um, we, we think it's somewhere around five Earth masses. And so that would put it in between um, the mass and also the size of Earth and Neptune, which is the planet that we don't have in our solar system currently. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that that planet, um, that type of planet, the one with the size between Earth and Neptune is the most common type of exoplanet that we found. Um, and we don't have one in our solar system. So that's kind of weird. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a hypothetical, hypothetical planet somewhere in between the size of Earth and Neptune that we haven't found yet. And hopefully we'll find if it exists, hopefully we'll find it soon. Uh, Mike Brown and Constantine Batigan actually recently published a new paper, I think over the summer uh, or early fall, um, basically with a, a map of where to find planet nine if it exists. So they, they did a whole search on a, a big public database of astronomy images um, and, you know, did this big search trying to find something that looked like planet nine, they didn't find it in that data set. And so based on that, they were able to say like, oh, um, if it has these characteristics um, with this size and this size orbit and like all of these different combinations of characteristics, we would have found it in this data set and we didn't, therefore, it can't have these characteristics. And so that they sort of put like, call them limits. Um, and so like, if, if planet nine looks a certain way and orbits the sun in a certain way, we would have found it in this data set and we didn't. Um, and so based on all of that, they basically made a map on the sky of where to look for planet nine and just sort of put it out there. And so- Crossed off this section over here and crossed right, off exactly. this section over here. <laughs> Okay. Right. And so there's like, there's sort of a hot spot conveniently right by the galactic plane. And so if, if you see oh. basically the galactic plane and in my virtual background behind me, right. there's a lot of stuff there. It's really hard to find new things in the galactic plane. Um, and so if planet nine's in the galactic plane, we might be waiting a while to find it. <laughs> that is true. Uh, uh, there's a related question from Oban Tophout, and that is, is there a current ETA for detection of, of Planet Nine based on, you know, there, I, I, you know, a couple of talks that I've seen Mike and Constantine give, they've said like, oh, we'll, we'll be able to say by, you know, 2019 or whatever, and here it is, and it's like, uh, guys, but, you know, science isn't always as you predict it to be. Sometimes it takes a lot longer, especially as you say, if it, if it's hiding in the, in the galactic plane where there's a lot of crowding from other sources, it might take a particularly long time. So do you know if there is any kind of, do either of you guys know if there's any kind of ETA on when that result might, might come about? I don't think there's anything like so specific like that. I think a lot of people are expecting that when the Vera Rubin Observatory comes online, mm -hmm. if it's in that data set, we'll find it pretty quickly. Um, but that's a big if it's in that data set. Um, and so it's, it's sort of a waiting game. If, it, if we don't find anything in uh, the Rubin Observatory data set when it comes online, that's uh, probably a bad sign, but it's not, um, yeah, we won't know. I think, I think uh, Rubin Observatory is gonna be. So that'll be the next kind of big instrument yep. that'll help in this particular search. And yep. remind me, uh, the Vera Rubin telescope, which, is going to be formerly known as LSST, uh, which is in northern Chile. It's being constructed right now. I think that's meant to come online in 2024? 2024. That... Yep. Sometime in the first six months of 2024. Is oh, that's right. Because you work, for, you work for the Vera Rubin Telescope. I have the inside knowledge. That's no. right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. 2024 is when it's expected. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, that unique perspective. Let's see what um, question, a question, another question about fast radio bursts from Ananda Ganguly. What is the oldest FRB or perhaps the, the most distant FRB that we've detected? Um, in other words, did the early universe just give out fast radio bursts? Was it just like, you have one, you have one, like Oprah, just giving them away? Or, um, or have we witnessed them that far back in time? Yeah, it's a really good question. What was happening in the early early universe and whether or not they're emitting FRBs. I think the farthest one we have and therefore the oldest one was Redshift 
two in a bit. So that would make the universe about a quarter of its current age. So maybe 3 billion years old or something. Um, we've never discussed, we never found an FRB from like Redshift six back when the universe was truly different looking. Um, but that's probably a matter of sensitivity and numbers. Yeah. Because it seems like if it truly is magnetars, which it appears to be these mag highly magnetized neutron stars, those would be present in the early universe. I mean, stars existed as far back as redshift of 10 or 11. So presumably you could have late, late stages of stars, stellar remnants yeah. like neutron stars, right? So yeah, exactly. And especially if you have a lot of very massive stars um, exploding, which I think was the case, you leave behind a lot of highly magnetized neutron stars. And so, yeah, it's totally possible that we'll find something from when the universe was like 500 million years old, for example. Okay. Um, oh, there was a question here. There's so many good questions. Sorry, guys. I'm, I'm filtering through them just to make sure I'm, I'm keeping them relevant to the previous question as best I can. Uh, Suhail Vallege asks, why are magnetars considered as a source of fast radio bursts compared to just any old vanilla neutron star? Is it just their extreme magnetic field or are there other characteristics that allow them to be detectable as these, as these bursts? And related to that, there was another question from, I think, uh, I think Scott Derwingson Peacock asking like, are these, are the, when they give off their emission, is it is it channeled in a jet, kind of like a quasar or an AGN, or is it just isotropic and 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 going in all directions, or is it is it like beamed towards us, which is why we can pick it up? So I guess that's kind of two questions related. Yeah, to those, those are both good questions. So the reason we think magnetars, just theoretically, before even even uh, having made that detection of the galactic FRB, is because of the energy budget, basically. So. The, big, the really confusing thing when we first discovered these is that they seem to be coming from a million times farther away than pulsars, which makes them a trillion times more energetic by the inverse square law. Okay, so not to get bogged down in it, but the point is that they had to be really, really energetic and that energy has to come from somewhere. So one place the energy can come from is the spin of the neutron star itself. Another place it can come from is the energy held in the magnetic field. And it turns out, basically the only way you can achieve that energy is if the star is really young and still has an enormous magnetic field. Um, yeah, so th those were the sort of theoretical motivations and it ended up lining up fairly well with our observations. For the beaming question, we still don't know. I suspect that FRB emission probably is beamed. Um, that, that actually helps with the, um, the energy problems that I was just talking about. Because you can imagine if you're emitting in all directions, then you have to have that much more energy. So I think it probably is beamed emission. I don't know how we're actually going to constrain that, but um, yeah, we'll see. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That was very good, Liam. Um, changing gears a little bit, there is a question about Oort, the Oort cloud from Dan Cooper. Are there any direct images of Oort cloud objects in the outer solar system, or are they just far too far away and too dim for us to be able to pick up with the telescopes that we have? Yeah, um, they're mostly too far away. Uh, so we, we don't have uh, any detections or images of objects that we know, like for sure this is an Oort cloud object. We have some, um, we know of some objects that are called that we're calling inner or cloud objects. So like these are objects that for whatever reason, one reason or another, maybe they, you know, um, got uh, sent in by a, a passing star billions of years ago or something and have been traveling in for that whole time. Um, but like for, for one reason or another, these objects sort of got displaced from the Oort cloud and like have come into the solar system. And so that's what we are calling these inner Oort cloud objects. Um, so they're not like truly Oort cloud objects. They're, they're just things that we think came from the Oort cloud that are now sort of in our solar system, like it, closer in where we can actually observe them. But yeah, everything else in the Oort cloud is just too far away, too faint for us to see. Or Oort cloud or, or uh, distant comets and such. 
Yeah, um, the ever elusive Oort cloud. <laughs> um, a question from Amina Musa. How do you determine the mass of an exoplanet? Nicole, this seems appropriate for you. Yeah, so usually the way that it's determined is through, you have basically use the radial velocity method and that'll give you information about the mass. I actually don't study radial velocity objects at all, fun fact. Um, I mostly study transiting planets, so we know nothing about the masses at all. But basically you can use the information from the Doppler shifting of the star. Basically you're looking at what the effect of the planet is and you can basically tease that out. You can tease out the mass from that, basically. There's a bunch of equations, but basically that's what it is. Um, and then, like I said, you have the masses from those objects. And if you couple those with radii from my favorite method, the transiting method, and I guess also the dark imaging method, but uh, you can actually get density information. And that's kind of what we're after. You really want to understand the whole object. So even if you have a mass or if you have a radius, independently, they're not as useful as being together. So you need to have objects that you can do both of those. Cool. Okay. Excellent. Um, so there was a kind of a clarifying question that we had from audience member Sanjay Sahani, and that is, because we've alluded to it several times, but it might be, it might be worthwhile to, to clarify, what is, say, redshift 10 and 9 and so on? Um, so so I'll, I'll take a, a stab at this. Um, so the universe, you know, all the stuff that we find out in space, uh, according to the, the predominant you know, theory for our understanding of its formation and its, its continual ev evolution is that it's expanding. This was discovered about a hundred years ago, um, first by Edwin Hubble and then later by many other people, that when you look at distant objects in space, like outside of our galaxy, much more distant than, out, than within our galaxy, um, when you see them, they're actually traveling away from us. And, and the farther away something is, the faster it's traveling away from us. And that's, you know, at first this was like, oh my gosh, this means we're at the center of the universe and everything is flying away from us. This is crazy. But if you think about it a little bit more, you can come up with a, a, a more kind of generic explanation for this. And that is that space, well, maybe it's generic. It's, it's actually super cool. Uh, space itself is expanding. And so if if there's more space in between you and a distant object and all of that space is expanding, it means that's, that stuff is gonna be traveling away from you uh, more than stuff that's close by. And it also means that it's not that we're special and we're in the center of the universe. Anyone at any location within the universe from their perspective will see all the other stuff traveling away from them. Um, and so this is kind of the, the, the basis for the Big Bang uh, cosmology model or more in more modern terms, it's it's uh, what's called the lambda CDM model, which takes into account the accelerating expansion of the universe through lambda, which is is kind of a uh, a shorthand for dark energy and the accelerating expansion of the universe. And CDM stands for cold dark matter, which is kind of what causes structures to collapse gravitationally within that expanding universe. Um, but all of this is kind of uh, the basis for the idea that the farther away something is, the faster it's traveling away from us. And what that means in real, in real terms is that just like, so you've probably heard of something called the Doppler effect, uh, which is where when something is traveling towards you uh, and it's emitting some sort of wave, oftentimes a sound wave or a light wave, uh, then we perceive that wave as being blue shifted when it's traveling towards us. And when it's traveling away from us and emitting a similar wave, it will be red shifted. So the example that always gets used is if you're sitting on the street and a car is pulling down its horn and it drives past you, as it approaches you, you hear that horn at like a higher pitch than it's actually being emitted, like ee! And then when it goes past you, it goes and kind of drops in frequency as it, as it goes past. That's the red shifting um, because it's stretching out that, that wave as it passes you and those wave uh, um, peaks are hitting you at a slower rate than they would otherwise because, you're, because it's taking into account the motion of the source of the, of the emission of that wave. But the same happens for light. And so a, a galaxy or a star or a, a magnetar perhaps that's emitting a fast radio burst as it's at a very distant location in the universe and there's some sort of expansion that's going on due to the, 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 the universe expanding itself, um, 
that object will be traveling away from us and we can measure the rate at which it's traveling away from us based on that the the wavelength of whatever light is traveling to us being stretched out and red shifted not not in a uh, in terms of a sound frequency but but redder in terms of light and so uh, astronomers use this as a shorthand for how far something is away from us based on how much its red its light has been red shifted relative to what it would be if it were right next to us and not moving um, moving relative to us. And so when they talk about the most distant objects in the universe, astronomers are really saying, they'll, they'll usually refer to it like, oh, it's at redshift of two, or it's at redshift of five, or redshift of 10. And that tells you two things. It tells you, it tells you ultimately how quickly that thing is moving away from us, which also implies about how far it is away from us. But it also tells you, because light travels at a finite speed, the time at which that that light was emitted uh, versus the age of the universe. So something that's on the other side of the universe, it's taken a long time for that light to travel across the intervening distance to us. And the universe has continued to age during that period. And so something that's very, very high redshift, like 10 or 11, is on the other side of the universe. And when that light was emitted, the universe was very, very young relative to how old it is right now. Um, so I'm kind of out of breath, but I think that that gives a general synopsis of the whole term of redshift. But I realize it's very confusing, and it's a jargon that we as astronomers throw around quite a bit. Yeah, and, sorry to sorry to be jargon. Oh no, no, Liam, that's totally reasonable. That's something that we as astronomers throw that around all the time. But um, but sometimes it takes a little bit of introduction because it's not a trivial a trivial. Uh, thing, even though we treat it that way all the time. Another example of it, by the way, is, um, and maybe the audience already knows this, I don't know, but we usually don't talk in light years. We usually talk in parsecs. And so if I'm giving a public talk um, or talking to a friend or something outside of astronomy, I'm always like computing parsec to light years in my head because it doesn't really come natural to me. Just, just like talking about distances as opposed to redshifts is hard. Yeah, super quick clarifying point, actually thinking about jargon. Um, I was just thinking about this. When I say the mass of an RV planet, it's actually M sine I. It's not actually the mass. So it's like, it's something that I don't think about that much because I just consider it the mass. That's the mass that we have. But the mass is actually an inclination-based effect. So we actually don't know what the inclination of those RV systems are. So that's the sign, just like trigonometry of the inclination. So unless they actually transit, we have no idea what the inclination is, but we just kind of say mass usually. Um, but quick, quick clarifying point on that is that it's always, if you're doing RVs, it's always M sine I, mass times the sine of the inclination. There are actually other ways that I'm thinking about getting masses, but that's the predominant way that you would get masses. Gotta love jargon. jargon. Are, there, are there any other secret jargony things from your from the from the area of Kuiper Belt and Oort Cloud objects from your work, Stephanie? Oh, always. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, what's, I don't know. No, you put me on the spot. I can't think of one. Well, it's okay. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean but to. Go on the spot. If you throw one out, I can define it. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a good question. Um, Walter Rutherford asks, speaking of Jupiter, as we were a few minutes ago, did we learn anything expect unexpected from Shoemaker-Levy, which I believe was the object, the comet that slammed into the surface of Jupiter in the, was that the, early 90s, mid 90s? Maybe I'm being totally wrong here, but that's that's what I recall. But um, yeah, maybe, maybe I need to Wikipedia this right now and reveal my ignorance. Um, Shoemaker, maybe. So yeah, the thing about comets is they always get not uh, named, um, named by the discoverers of the comet. So this was this is a big deal, uh, you know, the last couple hundred years, a lot of people would be like going out every night looking for comets because they wanted to get famous and maybe even rich by discovering these things. But I don't, um, I don't know if Shoemaker or Levy got, got rich and famous. Um, yes, that is the one that ran into Jupiter. So it disrupted, it disrupted and then slammed into the surface of Jupiter and made little like, boo, 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 boo. But I don't know, did that, do we know if that revealed anything about the interior structure about, I mean, I don't know, but it's okay if you don't either. 
I'm, I'm going to reveal my also ignorance. I'm currently on the Wikipedia page <laughs> for oh, okay. Shoemaker Levy. And apparently, okay. uh, let's see, it says you they did some chemistry studies, apparently, when it collided with the atmosphere. Um, and somehow you can like take spectra of the observation. So this is like you, you look at, uh, you collect the light from an object and you basically separate it into all of the wavelengths of light, like the whole rainbow. And then you, you measure, you know, how much light is in the red area, how much light is in the yellow area, how much light is in the blue area. Um, and, you know, beyond just the, the optical vision, like visual area of the, of the spectrum. Um, and by doing that, you can um, get some ideas of the chemical composition. So you can look at, you know, if there's uh, light in a certain area, like the, the red area, um, if there's more, I don't know if I'm mapping this correctly, but um, if there's light that's absorbed in a certain area, like some molecules absorb certain wavelengths of light. And so if you see um, a dip in the spectrum, like you're getting less light in a certain wavelength area than you're expecting, then maybe a certain molecule absorb that light for example. Um, and it looks like when they took spectra of where the comet hit Jupiter, um, they did not find oxygen bearing molecules, which apparently was a surprise. Um, they, they expected, I guess, to find molecules that had oxygen and they did not see that. Yeah, I don't awesome. know what that means, super but abundant, apparently that's a super surprise. Super abundant in the universe, super abundant in the solar system. I would expect to see oxygen too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why not, I guess. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you for thank you for fielding that on the spot. Incredible yeah, work. Uh, I, I encourage you to read the Wikipedia page because that's what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple of related questions, hard hitting questions from audience member uh, Jim Fermani. And, and that this is related to the fast radio bursts and radio studies. One is, what, is there any application for fast radio burst uh, research to date? Like application, I, I imagine he means like outside of us understanding the nature of the universe, which I guess isn't for most people, but- An like actual application. An actual application. And, oh and a related God. question is, if you had to make an argument hard hitting journalism here. If you had to make an argument to justify the cost of putting radio telescopes on the dark side of the moon, what would you say? <laughs> um, okay, so for the former question, actual applications, basically no. I mean, we use, we use like modern machine learning tools sometimes and you know, lots of us are effectively in our day-to-day -day jobs data scientists which means there, there can be some spill from our algorithm papers that, that can be useful. Uh, but the short answer to your question is no. The, the uh, thing to keep in mind though, is that with this sorts of research, even though the goal is, is kind of fundamental research, fundamental physics or astronomy or whatever, often there are offshoots te with technological applications. So for example, Wi-Fi came out of a radio astronomer tinkering around. And this of course became a many hundred billion or even trillion uh, dollar technology. I'm not saying that's going to happen with fast radio bursts, obviously. No, but I I 150% agree with the statement because you know there's there's the assumption that like you know darn you silly astronomers and physicists you guys should go work on applied physics applied sciences to make the world a better place instead of just looking through your telescopes and and looking through your microscopes and that sort of thing. But to be honest, like pure research like this sort of stuff. Is, incredible, is an incredible investment for, for future technologies. You know, th the nature of technology is oftentimes we don't know the correct direction to go. And we don't know what's gonna reveal the next breakthrough. And as a perfect example of this, look to the middle of the 19th century. The middle of the 19th century, the biggest technology was steam. And we were, we were all about steam. We were building railroads. We were doing everything based on shoveling coal into a furnace, burning that and causing like steam to, to power various things. And sure, it was, it was pretty efficient in the middle of the 19th century, but there was some dude who just happened to be tinkering around with uh, magnets and 
electrical circuits and light and figured out, oh, hey, look, these are all related and these are all related phenomena. And now we have the electromagnetic spectrum that relates uh, uh, oscillations of magnetic and electrical fields um, from magnets and circuits to the, the transmission of light. And that's led to basically the entire 20th century and 21st century technological foundation with electrical circuits, semiconductors, um, the internet, Wi-Fi, uh, optical, you know, uh, optic, what are they called? How, how do you get your internet through, through optic channels, through um, fiber optics, all these things. Like if we'd stuck on and been like applied, we'd live in a steampunk world that would suck. I mean, look, steampunk's kind of cool, right? In a weird, weird way, but it would not be the world that we live in today that, that the technology that we've seen and the huge technological innovations that have taken place. Unless, cool. unless people had just been tinkering around doing weird stuff and come up with these kind of offshoots. So, you know, directed research is good and all, but oftentimes you get serendipitous discoveries that come out of totally unknown regions. And there's, that's why there's a huge amount of stuff going in towards dark energy. It's this unknown energy source that's powering the expansion, the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. And, you know, that could be, yeah, it's crazy. And we don't really understand it at all, but that could be something that we tap into and could power uh, future energy production that's way beyond coal and oil and solar and wind and nuclear. It could be like the next thing and it could be a huge, huge deal. And maybe it's not. Maybe, maybe we don't have a way to extract that energy. But doing research for the purpose of doing research to better understand the nature of the world will have applications and will have technological benefits for society. So I don't know. That's my TED talk. Go, go fund go fund pure research and, and con convince your, your, your senators to, to do the same. <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> for the, for the question, I, say I agree with all of that. <laughs> go ahead, Leon. What were you saying? I was going to say for um, the question of putting a radio telescope on the dark side of the moon, I'm actually not sure that I would defend that idea. Obviously with finite resources and finite budgets, it's all a matter of cost, but I don't think it's, the number one priority of radio astronomy over the next couple of decades. Well, then that begs the question, what is the number one priority of radio astronomy over the next few decades? Building my totally hypothetical, <laughs> optimism, obviously. <laughs> you, you, would, you would opt for building, you described it as a omni, omni detector, om, what was it? Omniscope. You, omniscope, you would, you would defend that before building a scope that's outside of RFI on the, uh, of radio frequency interference, the equivalent of like radio uh, light pollution on the far side of the moon? Yeah, yeah, I think I would. Okay. I mean, there, so, there are pilot projects that are putting radio antennas and building little telescopes on the dark side of the moon, which are very exciting. And China and the Netherlands are collaborating on this. Um, so if it can be done efficiently and cheaply and shown to work, that's fine. But if it's, if it's gonna cost like $5 billion, then of course not. No, I agree with that. I agree with that. But will your Omniscope cost less than $5 billion to construct? I'll do, I'll do it for you for 50 million. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. That's fair. Um, yeah. One of the, just a, a reminder for those of, of you guys who weren't reading the astronomy news over the last few weeks, uh, there was the re release of what's called the decadal survey. And this is related to another question that we had in the audience. Um, so every 10 years, the astronomical community kind of gets together and everybody writes a bunch of papers uh, suggesting what they think the priorities for the entire field should be over the next 10 years. And I think this time, correct me if I'm wrong, there was something on the order of 300 or 400 different papers that were written about what priorities should be heralded and, and focused on by the entire astronomical community. And then a number of other astronomers, kind of head honcho astronomers got together and reviewed all of these different perspectives and, and papers and effectively decided what should be our focus so that we have a consensus that then goes to funding agencies like NASA or the National Science Foundation or the American, uh, the US Congress for funding these sorts of efforts. And that came out about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, something like that. And uh, 
one of those one of those recommendations was for something called the next generation very large array so you may be familiar with the idea of the the vla the very large array which is a radio set of radio telescopes um in new mexico in a place called socorro new mexico it was featured in a number of films the most notable probably of which was contact starring jody foster and and matthew mcconaughey from 1996. really good movie i i love that movie and the book i think they're super awesome and um better than the arrival even better than the arrival you heard it you heard it here first people better than the charlie sheen uh film from that was also in the 90s or was that in the 80s yeah it was 96 90, oh, 96 see <laughs> two radio tells radio astronomy uh films coming out simultaneously one little fanfare the other written by carl sagan um so yeah contact is super good but the Very Large Array is this telescope that's been in operation in New Mexico. It consists of 27 different radio dishes that all point at the same location in space simultaneously and collect radio waves and, and put together kind of an artificial image of what, what they're looking at in space. Super cool instrument. It's aging a bit. I think it was constructed in the 70s and 80s. You guys will have to correct me, but I think it was around then. It was after Arecibo, but not too long after Arecibo. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so uh, the decadal survey, uh, one of one of its focuses for the for the future was to to create the next generation VLA and 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 to hopefully fund the next generation VLA, which is a much larger effort. And I actually don't know a lot of the details, but I know it's a substantially um, larger number of of telescopes spread out over a much larger um, space as well. It's over most of like much of the continental United States. Um, yeah, up, up to very high frequencies as well. So yeah, so, this radio so is that is that kind of like your omniscope? A little bit, although because you have dishes, you you really are pointed in one direction. You don't you don't have an enormous field of view. You don't have the omni aspect of the omniscope. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So let's see. Ooh, Piper Trip comments. The Omniscope sounds very steampunk. I agree with that. <laughs> I agree with that. Um, let's see. Additional questions. Amina Musa asks, how long do planets take to form once a star is born? And do gas giants take a longer time to form compared to rocky planets? Cool. I'm excited yeah. about this because I'm going to learn something. <laughs> I'm going to learn something because I don't know the answer to these questions. Favorite topic. Yeah. So um, like I said, I mostly study different ways of probing planet formation and what we think specifically actually for Jupiter kind of gas giant planets. So the important thing to note about uh, these circumstellar disks, these disks around a uh, star is that once a star is born, they're kind of born with a bunch of material that will form into a disk, a bunch of gas and dust, and literally just materials that are forming from the star too, but it's just gas and dust. And what happens is the materials that are in that disk form into your planets, but the gas that's in that disk only stays for about 10 million years is sort of what we expect the lifetime of this gas to be before it sort of dissipates. So in order to form these gas giant planets like Jupiter, you need to have gas there, which means they had to have formed sort of in the first 10 million years. And that's true for no matter how big your planets are, if they're gaseous planets. So in direct imaging, which I kind of alluded to as one of my, my sort of other favorite um, methods of detecting planets and characterizing them, they're these massive objects, like, you know, you can be 10 Jupiter masses or bigger. You need to have all of that gas be accreting while the gas still exists. So we think they had to have basically formed quite early. We think that the sort of other part of that, those rocky planets formed sort of after is one of the theories, is that once the gas dissipates and you need to get to a certain, like I mentioned before, core mass in order to start creating that gas on. So, you know, 10 Earth masses, something like that, in order to start accreting that gas. So if you don't build up a core, which basically just happens kind of like think about snowballs, if you keep hitting things together, it builds bigger and bigger. So you think about that core as these sort of snowballs, you know, it's just dust that's hitting in and accreting and getting bigger and bigger. But if you don't get big enough, you won't accrete enough gas. So that can happen later in life of these disks before, um, after that gas dissipates. So you end up with these rocky objects sort of forming afterwards. There's some theories about sort of forming earlier too, but that's one of the theories is that they form later. 
and like I said, I'm really interested in these, these gaseous planets because they interact with their natal disks, with those disks that they're born in. And with direct imaging, you can see that interaction, which is really cool. There are these really amazing images of PDS-70, which is just a directly imaged system. It has two baby planets, we call them protoplanets, that are still actively forming and actively accreting their gas. And you can see in these gorgeous ALMA data, this Atacama large sub millimeter, submillimeter array data, you can see the protoplan, like basically the disk around the planet and how that is accreted from that gas. So that's actually what would form, for example, uh, Jupiter's moons, um, those circumplanetary disks. So for all that to happen, all that gas and dust to be around, they need to happen in the first 10 million years, they think, is sort of the, the canonical time frame. And then the sort of rocky planets would form after with a lot of the material that's left over. Really like planet formation. I'm yeah. not so close about the masses of these objects, but I'm really <laughs> interested about how they, how they form. Yeah, I think another piece of that also, at least for our own solar system, is the reason that the rocky planets are closer into the sun um, and therefore are much less massive is because when you get close to the star, the temperatures start rising. And so when you get too close, you, you get closer than what we call this snow line or this ice line. And once you get closer than that, then all of like, you know, your water ice, your nitrogen ice, all of these sort of like icy things um, are now gas. And so they can't be part of the material that goes in and forms your core. They're not solid. Um, and so you, you sort of lose all of that material in those ices that could otherwise be part of the core. And so that, at least in, the, in our own solar system, is also why we think the gas giant planets that are farther away grew so much bigger is because those ices also um, went into what formed those sort of initial cores that could then accrete a whole bunch of gas later. And so those ices? The, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Nicole, please. Because those ices and that material is also really cool because it can accrete onto the planets, which is called late stage accretion of solids, into these gaseous envelopes and drive up what we call the metallicity. Um, I'm in a geology department, so metallicity to the geologist means something very different than metallicity to the astronomers. So anything that's not hydrogen and helium is considered a metal to an astronomer. The geologists get very mad at me when I say that like oxygen is a metal, but it is for our purposes. You know, they're trace elements in the universe. Um, but that's what we think drives up the metallicity for these atmospheres is these solids, these late stage accretion of solids. So if there's more sort of stuff around, it can still do things to the way that these planets are forming. And it's interesting because, you know, Jupiter has an increased, there's actually a really interesting trend in the solar system with increasing mass and decreasing atmospheric metallicity. So Jupiter has the lowest atmospheric metallicity of the gas giant planets. And the smaller planets, uh, Neptune has the highest atmospheric metallicity, which we think should be some reason that that's happening, but we don't know. We, we genuinely don't know. We don't really see the same thing in exoplanets. So we know what's happening, but like Stephanie was saying, the solar system is really good for confusing us also, I think is what I'm kind of, the more I studied the solar system, we're like, oh, we know what to expect and never get what we expect. It's really interesting. No, though. if if anything, all I've learned is that our solar system is actually kind of weird in the context of all the other planetary systems and we don't actually know what's happening. <laughs> It's so it's so unfortunate though because we got into exoplanet science is only you know a few decades old so we had the solar system we're like okay we know what to expect we know exactly what planets are going to be there and then the most popular planet in the you know galaxy doesn't exist in our solar system like what is happening so it's definitely it's definitely taken a lot of creativity to try to blend the solar system science that we have that's so in depth and so detailed over the last you know decades longer than I think any of us have been alive um, with the relatively new exoplanet science. Like I said, evolving constantly, you know, very quickly evolving. We're realizing that we're wrong about a ton of things all the time. It's great. You think that that's a function of just what our telescopes and our instruments and our techniques are in terms of sensitivity to certain kinds of, like we're very sensitive because of the radial velocity technique for determine, for detecting exoplanets to seeing really massive uh hot Jupiters that are very close into their parent star. And so we see a lot of those. And yet, I think that was what you were alluding to when you said, we don't see that sort of thing in our own solar system, even though we see that in other solar systems. Do you think there is the possibility that our solar system is a very unique system? Or is there a possibility that our solar system is totally run of the mill, but we just don't have the, the, the sensitivity to be able to, de to detect other systems like our own? My opinion is probably a combination of both. So hot Jupiters are not quite as common as we 
thought they were when we first detected them. So the you know, radial velocity method, basically the way it works is it's a mass ratio. So the more massive the exoplanet is, the more signal you'll get. And that's what I was kind of referring to before. So you get these more massive planets, you're gonna have better signals. Um, radial, the transit method is more sensitive to big planets. So if you have big and massive planets, um, you're gonna have a better signal, but that's not what we see in our own solar system. So the first things we saw were these hot Jupiters, these sort of really close in um, large planets. And those aren't as common as we thought, I think when we started looking at these planets, which is what we kind of saw with the transiting exoplanet survey satellite and moreover Kepler. So these two space-based uh, satellites that did a lot of the, the transit method because you need a lot of precision, which is quite hard from the ground. Um, so I think it's probably a combination is that we don't see the things that we know we should see, these Neptune, these, you know, a couple of Earth, super Earth objects between, um, you know, a couple of times the, the Earth mass, which are very, very common that we just don't have, um, possibly with planet nine, we don't really know. Um, but it's, there's a sensitivity limit too. you know, direct imaging is a really big field for instrumentation development um, and pushing forward a lot of our optics knowledge. But we have very few planets because the kinds of planets that we're sensitive to with that method um, that being big and far out because you need to decouple the planet and the starlight aren't that common, we think, these really massive, really far out objects. So yeah, it's a combination, but my money is still on the solar system is just really weird. Oh. Yeah, I think it's weird. It's not unique, but it's weird. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think is, is the way to phrase that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and then I just had a, a clarification point when you were talking about the ice line or the snow line. What would be the distance of the ice line or the snow line in our solar system today? Today? Um, I It's like there's the ice giants, you know, Uranus and Neptune, which there's there's definitely icy stuff. But but then I think about Enceladus and Europa being around Jupiter and Saturn, and those are icy moons, but maybe they've migrated. So maybe like the ice line or the snow line that existed early in the solar system's formation has shifted over the you know, I guess the luminosity of the sun hasn't changed dramatically in that time scale, but but I don't I don't know. I'm not a planetary scientist, so I figured I'd check with the experts. Yeah, um, so it has definitely migrated over the course of the solar system's history as um, our our sun has sort of settled into you know what it is today. Um, I think the current snow line, I, like snow slash ice line, it depends on who you talk to, what you call it, but I think it's around five astronomical units. So like just inside the orbit of Jupiter. Jupiter okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. That makes sense. Interesting. I think, um, oh, where did it start? I think it, it started like at the very beginning of the solar system, it was somewhere around three astronomical units. So like somewhere in the asteroid belt. Um, and it has since like sort of migrated outward. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, sorry, there's lots of good questions here and I'm just trying, we only have a few minutes left and I'm just trying to pick out the, the, the best ones since we can't unfortunately uh, get to all of them. Um, Okay, we'll do we'll do two last ones. The the second to last one from Suhail Suhail Valle. Uh, what effect do multiple star systems have on exoplanets? So we know of 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 multiple like binary stars and triple star systems and that sort of thing. What impact does that have on the planetary systems that that might orbit around one or the other or all of those combined? Yeah, that's the key, what the architecture is of that system. So, you know, a lot of stars have companion stars, um, most do um, have, you know, there's some structure and hierarchy to a lot of these star systems. But the main thing is that what do the stars do to each other's disks, basically? And that's the material that's going to be forming the planets. So we want to know what is happening with that? What gravitational pull do the two stars or multiple stars have on a disk? Is there a shared disk that's around the two of them? Um, because if you have a close enough binary system, for example, it's all a binary, the disk can form around them. And then you can have planets that are, you know, around two stars that are orbiting each other or something like that. So it really depends on the structure. Uh, it does seem to make a difference just based on the material. Um, but you can have planets and, you know, around plenty of other weird architectures for stars. There's a lot of really, really weird planets. There's, you know, 
planets that are around a star that's around another star that's around another star, but that's also a binary. It's, it's complicated, but basically anything can form as long as you have a disk around it. Long story short. No, that's great. Yeah. That's great. It's also the other thing. We really don't know. <laughs> um, okay, we, we have a little bit more time. So uh, what about, so Cliff Watson asks, um, just how far would you have to be away from a pulsar uh, to no longer be in danger of the radiation from the pulsar? So either, I guess this could mean both like, is there a danger zone where you're too close to a magnetar where it's really bad news for us? Clearly, if the sun were a magnetar, I think that would be, that would not be great for us, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. But um, if <laughs> fast radio bursts are indeed like a beam, is there... Is there a proximity where we wouldn't want to be? Because uh, that's true for gamma ray bursts and that's true for supernovae. If they're too close to us, it's it's bad news bears for us on Earth. Yeah. So is that true for fast radio bursts as well and magnetars? Well, so for pulsars, pulsars and magnetars, a lot of them can uh, can emit at high energy. So if you were if you were close to a magnetar during one of its high energy bursts, so emitting gamma rays or X rays or whatever, you, you'd be in big trouble. I don't know the effect. I don't think. I don't think anybody knows the effect of um, really strong magnetic field radio pulses and what they do to uh, to human beings. People speculate with Havana syndrome that uh, a very strong pulse of EM radiation can you know, give you mild traumatic brain injury or something. Can you tell so, us about Havana syndrome too. I, you want background on Havana syndrome? Well, yeah, because I, I mean, I know what that is only pr uh, peripherally based on having read it in the news, but maybe our, I, I think it's super interesting what I've heard. So maybe our audience, that, I think that'd be good context for what. Yeah. Means. So I think in like, is it now four places around the world or something? Havana, Moscow, Beijing, maybe somewhere else. Uh, U.S. like diplomats, ambassadors or something all reported these very strange symptoms. Um that they claim to be caused by some sort of attack. It's something like, it's sort of like a concussion symptom or something. Um, and some people claim it's mass hysteria. Other people claim it's these very targeted microwave weapons where you direct a, a radio pulse basically at a person and you can give them some sort of brain injury. I have no idea what the origin of this stuff is, but yeah, by analogy, if you get close enough to a pulsar, eventually you're going to be experiencing some very strong radio waves yourself. And maybe there's a point at which you get traumatic brain injury from a pulsar. I don't know. I mean, I guess that makes sense. Like our brains, our brains emit radio waves. Like that's a, one of the ways in which our brains are studied is from, from putting electrodes here and there and the other place to, to monitor, you know, alpha waves and beta waves and all these sorts of things. So if we're, if we're able to, transmit these presumably we're also able to to respond to an ambient radio wave uh environment so i guess if you slam it with a high enough intensity radio wave you could you could alter the behavior of the brain yeah possibly i mean i don't know i'm not i'm not a neuroscientist that's not what i do but it just seems reasonable like if something is well, able to transmit at a given frequency then it would also be able to receive at a given frequency you know my <laughs> My girlfriend is a neuroscientist. Oh, well, and she, bring I, her on. I think, I'm not going to quote her on this, but I think she said she felt weird after being in a seven Tesla MRI scanner. Seven Tesla, sort of, the, I think the strongest magnetic field for, for MRIs. Um, she said she felt weird. I don't know. Whoa. <laughs> that's a lot of, that's a high magnetic field. Seven Teslas. Jeez. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Like 10 to the minus 11 magnetars. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Last question. And that is kind of a question for all of us. And it's related to something I brought up before. So Peter, Peter Dvork asks, what are you most excited about with the recent decadal survey or most disappointed with the recent decadal survey results? So I alluded to this decadal survey that happens once every 10 years. And it talks about what the focus for the new next decade should be about what the astronomical community should make as its priorities. Um, so what, did you guys see any highlights or any disappointments in the direction that 
that was kind of decided for us on the on on how things were going to be meted out in the future out of pure self-interest we were of course very excited to see them talk about this radio camera idea so i showed in my slides the deep synoptic array that we're currently building and in the owens valley the upgrade to that the sort of next level one is called the dsa 2000 and it got referenced in the decadal survey and, and with fairly positive language so we're excited about that exciting and and remind me with dsa 2000 the 2000 stands for for basically 2000 different separate antennae, right? Yeah, two, 2000 little smaller telescopes combined into one fairly massive one. And how many how many FRBs is it predicted to be able to detect and localize uh, per per year if it's at, you know, in ideal conditions? Maybe about 5000 per year. Vic, Vikram Ravi, a professor at Caltech and I have been thinking about these numbers. Yeah could be a very powerful FRB machine amongst other things. That's pretty exciting. That's pretty exciting. Um, Nicole and Stephanie, do you guys have any, any highlights or, or lowlights to the results of the, of the decadal that were released recently? Um, yeah, I think one of the things that I was at least interested in, and I'm curious to see how they approach this, was um, there wasn't like a big space-based mission that was recommended. And uh, it was more recommended that NASA sort of come up with a procedure for you know, developing these ideas more thoroughly before they even get to this like big proposal stage. Um, so just a, a more streamlined and effective way to get like space-based missions up into space. Um, so that was something I was really interested in and excited to see because um, like the 90s were a great era for NASA. We had four big space-based telescopes that were launched and we haven't really had anything since then. And Hubble, oh, fingers crossed to hold on for a bit longer. <laughs> um, but like, we don't know how long that's gonna last. Um, so I, I was interested in that part and I'm, I'm curious to see what comes of that. Um, and I was also really happy to see a big focus on sort of the human side of astronomy as well. Um, and, you know, acknowledging that there are some problems in the field with, in regards to, you know, uh, representation and diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and I was really excited to see that have like a really strong focal point in the, in the decadal this year. I thought that was cool. Um, I agree with your statement about the 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 excitement surrounding the need for like technology development and 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 getting out space-based missions more frequently um because i mean obviously the the kind of elephant in the room is the james webb space telescope having taken a long time you know longer than was proposed and a lot more money than was proposed and i think a lot of that that particular recommendation was kind of in response to that so we can gain a little bit more credibility when we go to congress and give them like oh, we've got a timeline of X and it's gonna cost Z dollars, um, actually being able to hold up to that instead of saying like, oh, well, we just went you know, over budget by a factor of 10 and, and all of this. So, so I'm, yeah, I'm excited about that. Um, and having more space-based missions go up. I think you know, the lowering cost of, of space, aerospace and everything is, is, um, is leading potentially to, to benefits for that as well. Nicole? Yeah, I just want to echo what Stephanie said about uh, a lot of the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, practices. There were some really great concrete things that can be done that were recommended to try to increase diversity in, you know, astronomy. And I think that was really great. And I didn't necessarily expect that much, you know, force behind that. And that was really nice to see. Um, I also thought it was interesting that there were two main space-based sort of concepts that were kind of HabEx and Louvre, these two really big space-based telescopes. And they kind of didn't really, they said something in the middle is basically what ended up happening. And people came up with a lot of really fun names for the combination of the two. Um, I forgot what they were, but there's a lot of different, like, you know, Louvre is already, astronomy likes acronyms. Louvre is already an acronym, you know, so doing a bunch of acronyms together. Um, but yeah, I thought it was a really interesting sort of yeah, there's been a lot of sort of, you know, mistakes that have been made in astronomy before we can fix them, whether it be financial mistakes or, you know, not that it's a mistake, but sort of misjudging of how expensive we expected JWST to be, but also just like you said, on the people side, um, with a lot of people that have sort of 
leaky pipeline, um, not made it to uh, sort of professorships or whatever the ideal is in, in academia. So I really thought that was great, the sort of reckoning with what's been going on for the last decade. Yeah, that's true. I was, I was, I was a little disappointed that there was less of a focus on public education, partially from a self-serving aspect of things, but also partially because I think public, uh, public perception of science is, is pretty polarizing these days. You know, I think the pandemics really brought that out and there's a lot of politicized, politicalization, maybe that's a word, politicalization of, of science that I don't think should really be there. I think regardless of your political, uh, perspective, we can all agree that science is generally for the for for serving society, for serving the individuals of our society and, and shouldn't really be a political standpoint. And it's unfortunate that, that certainly in certain aspects, most prominently right now, vaccination and, and the pandemic, it's really gotten politically polarized. And and I think um, and 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 potentially also from the perspective of um, you know, trying to build massive telescopes, uh, we've run into a lot of difficulties. Uh, for instance, building the the thirty meter telescope, the TMT, uh, because of difficulties um, with some of the Native Hawaiians not seeing it as beneficial to 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 their views um, and building it in in uh, in certain locations in Hawaii. And and I feel like that could, in some ways, be addressed through through reaching out through public education works and that sort of thing. So, um, so I'd hoped, you know, not to, not to put a pall over all of this wonderful discussion, but I'd hope that there'd be a slightly more of a, of an investment or a focus on, on the possibility of having science communication, um, in, in the next decade be a focus, but, uh, but say lobby as a, as a professionally employed science communicator, I'm also disappointed by that. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, um, well, thank you uh, to everyone here. Liam, excellent presentation. Uh, very, very well done. Very good level. And you covered, you know, the history of the field extremely well. So thank you. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Nicole and Stephanie, excellent job on our Q&A panel. I learned a lot from all three of you guys. So thank you very much for your, for your time tonight on a Friday night. And thank you to our audience for tuning in uh, when you could be out at a bar, uh, you know, partying it up, dancing till the early morn. And here you are learning about astronomy with the four of us. So, so many thanks. And um, I will assemble the presentations and talks and astronomy on tap events for the new year. We probably won't get started until the middle, like middle part of January, maybe like the 10th or so. Uh, people, people need to have a break. I'm going to have a hard time getting people around New Year's. So, um, so I'll, I'll put that online pretty soon. So stay tuned. But um, thanks, everybody for for participating. And I hope you guys have a wonderful uh, weekend and a wonderful holiday season. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Cameron.